Okay, so um, last minute stand in. Um, from Microsoft, Ethan is going to talk on DevOps and the budget. So over to you, Ethan. Thank you. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Reactor. Um, as you already know, this is one of our amazing space. Um, I'm not in London too much. I'm from Yorkshire, born and bred in Barnsley. I'm very proud to come from Barnsley. Uh, but I do like to venture to London as well. We've got a few offices here. Um, and I'm actually doing a student uh, day tomorrow as well. So this is a talk I did um, at the Met headquarters about four months ago now, DevOps on a budget. Uh, being from the north, I'm very tight. Um, not just by stereotype. So I, you know, obviously wanted to imply it as well into sort of my work, if you like. Um, I used to work for some tight companies. This is sort of my story. It's a bit about me. Um, I'm a cloud storage architect at Microsoft. Uh, I've been at Microsoft now about nine months. Um, hopefully with the current news, I'll still be here next month. Um, I currently, um, I run a few meetups. So I run Young DevOps, which is all about early in careers um, and DevOps, that kind of thing. Um, I also run another meetup called Yorkshire DevOps, which is all about DevOps, but focusing all in Yorkshire. Uh, we need more events up north. Um, and I also run the Yorkshire Azure User Group, one of my amazing colleagues, um, Ethan Jones as well, um, a couple of the Microsoft folk. And we're also organizing DevOps Days Manchester as well. Uh, we are going to do it. It's likely going to be in 2024 at this point. Um, but yeah, so I specialize in FinOps. Who here, put your hand up, has heard of FinOps? Okay, who here has implemented FinOps? Okay, who here actually likes FinOps? <laughs> there we go, good, good response. Um, but yeah, I've start, started doing more work with the FinOps Foundation as well. They're really cool, highly recommend you go and check them out and get certified. They're looking to really do more stuff in the UK. I believe they had an event. Um, last week or, or it's next week, I can't remember. Um, but I'm trained specialising in Kubernetes and HPC. I'm part of the um, High Performance Computer Squad at Microsoft. Um, we do some cool things. I mainly work with digital natives, so driverless cars and all that kind of thing. Um, my main experience is in infrastructure as code transformations, uh, building teams and DevOps transformations as well. So what is DevOps? You should already know that. Um, but DevOps is, in my opinion, at least anyway, a culture. Um, it is technical processes about technical tools, but the underlying thing is a culture. But one sort of key word I really want to put in, in play really is that DevOps is accessible. I think this is really key, is that whether you're um, you know, in a new organization, you know, you've got like two people, or you're a great big enterprise with thousands of staff, DevOps is accessible, you can implement it, there's no barrier to entry. Um, I know certain things in IT, you know, you don't need you know, large amounts of teams or large amount of budgets, etc. Everyone can do it, whether you do it on a small scale or an enterprise scale as well. So a bit about it, so a set of practices, tools, and culture. Um, it's philosophy, it automates, and integrates process between development and operations. Um, it focuses mainly around team empowerment, love that word, um, cross-team communication, and sort of from, from an automation standpoint as well. So here's the lovely um, sort of thing that you've seen all evening, but yeah. So open source, who here, stick your hand up if you like open source. Okay, who here, stick your hand up if you don't like open source. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, key point is it's free with an asterisk. So, what I mean by that is, is that open source is great. You can utilize it. Majority of the big tools like Jenkins etc. are open source. Um, but you've got to focus on, is it, is it well maintained? Is the community there? Is there a wider community around it? Can you get staff trained in it? You know, is it going to be you know, carried on long term if it's a relatively new tool and you adopt it at an enterprise scale in five years? Is it going to be there? Um, you know, and things like the Log4J instant and things like that, security around it as well. A lot of companies are open source and they have a managed version as well, which they make money off and that sort of spins around. At Microsoft, we're really key on open source. We have an entire team. We basically pay engineers to just do open source all day. I know they have the fun jobs, unlike us lot. So um, yeah, it's, it's a key thing. Um, but I highly recommend you contribute to open source. It's a great way to get involved with the community and learn skills. I highly recommend it to people trying to get into the industry as well. So the benefits of open source and DevOps, so it's flexible. You know, you can integrate as much, uh, much or as little as you want. It's free, there's um, you know, little barrier to entry. You can focus around speed as well, utilizing different tools. I've worked for bosses in the past where they'll think of an open source tool and go, right, let's build it themselves. And I'm like, well, there's only two of us in a back office in Rotherham, well, I can't do that. Um, so we have to you know, utilize open source if you like. Then you've got the agility as well, and of course, talent. You know, utilizing open source in your organization, having that developer blog might be a good way of attracting talent, particularly in an area where you know, we're quite short on talent at the moment. 
Um, but yeah, I thought some people have even been hired by contributing to open source. Um, I believe, I think it was GitLab, someone was hired from GitLab by contributing to their open source and things like that. And then they sort of saw them and hired them. So it's a good way. So DevOps in a small to medium business. So stick your hand up if you work for a small to medium business. Come on, good, good. Not everybody needs to work in, a, in an enterprise, remember that. So a couple issues. So from what I've found, it's my own personal experience. So some small to medium businesses, they are reluctant to change. Um, there's often resistant leadership, what I would call traditional leadership as well. Uh, I call it the SMB life cycle, particularly in Yorkshire, where there's very few big enterprises in lots of areas like Barnsley, etc., where you've got someone who left school, joined an SMB, and then left that SMB to probably create their own SMB, um, or you know, keep hopping between the two. They don't get larger enterprise experiences, and they don't get different ways of working. They've always been in the same mindset. And it does happen. My old boss was like that as well. Um, so current processes, you know, huge investment in terms of cost of resources. If you've got two or three developers, like I've been in that scenario, you know, for you to pick a task and go run with it, is like such a huge significant resources and things like that. If you've got like a team of multiple teams of developers and you pick something, it doesn't really work out. Yeah, you know, it's bad, but it's not the end of the day. But if you've got three developers, you spend three months on a tangent, you're screwed. So sort of the benefits really of DevOps to SMBs. So you can increase communication and collaboration, really key words. It's all about communicating and collaborating as a team. You can adapt to the market with speed and agility. And you can improve technical resources, remove blockers, love that word. Um, you know, breaks down silos and of course improve customer experience, which is really key. If you're a small business, whether you supply to a niche or whether you go to a wider market, you need to differentiate, sorry, differentiate yourself from a go-to market strategy and things like that. And you know, you've got to be really key. I used to work for a podcasting startup and uh, the founder was really, really like key on responding really quickly. And that's how he built his name and community because he was quick to respond to market trends and processes and you know, customer queries and things. And everybody loved him for that. And it just sort of plateaued from there. So from a tooling standpoint, um, this talk is a, a couple of months old now, but this at the time, these are some things which tools I pick. So um, Atlassian Suite, Azure DevOps from Code, you know, GitHub, Bitbucket, Git, you know, Docker, Terraform, you know, Pulumni and things like that. You've got Jenkins, GitLabs, Azure DevOps, um, and Grafana and things like that, JFrog. So how to utilize DevOps on a budget? So SaaS products, small team discounts. You often see like Jira, Atlassian Suite. They've got discounts and things for smaller teams. You can do that as open source. Of course, obviously, the mindset is really key. The cloud, uh, free training as well. There's lots of free training in Microsoft Learn. Sick hand up if you use Microsoft Learn. Awesome. Hey, exactly, yeah. That's one thing that we beat AWS lockdown. over. Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> the lockdown, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's really good. There's loads of different hands-on labs, etc. It's really cool. It doesn't just cover DevOps in Azure. Uh, it covers .NET, etc. as well. Um, you've got development, obviously, and focusing on your path to production. So before I move on to doing a DevOps transformation on a two grand budget, um, yes, that was true. I just did it for less than that, but that's a bit of a, a catchy title. Um, has anybody heard of Azure Landing Zones? Yeah, so that's a really cool scenario. Um, so before this, so I, I was using AWS. This is an AWS-focused talk. Um, but Azure Landing Zones is something which we've got to help mitigate this, if you like. So it's a piece of reference architecture. I've not got it up there. Um, but I've been doing a lot of work with uh, at the moment uh, with a lot of public sector clients. And it's essentially where you can deploy to the cloud, have the best practices and reliability, scalability, governance, operational efficiency, and all that kind of jazz. And it's just there, and you just click a button in Azure, three click ops, and it's deployed. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's a great way of getting started. I wish I would have had this two years ago. It would have saved me a lot of pain. So a bit of background info. I worked for Small Team Business. Uh, no surprise there. It was on-premises. Um, it was consultancy. We had multiple SaaS products. Um, few operational pain points, you know, limited path to production, and of course, multiple development blockers as well. So, open questions to the room. Who do you, what do you think is the biggest blocker to small to medium business from a DevOps standpoint? Budget. Budget, yep, good one. Any others? Human resources. Definitely. Resources, yeah, definitely. Lack yeah. of uh, knowledge of where to approach uh, sort of, uh, DevOps practice. practice. 
Yeah, definitely. So th there's quite a few different things. It's a lot of challenges. And unless you've never worked in one, you, you won't experience it. So how do I do it? So I focus on a couple of key areas. So from a people standpoint, I focused on removing blockers within the organization. Um, I created an internal culture. Um, it used to drive the developers insane because I'd say, look, do your AWS certifications, learn about docs, let's have meetings, let's do Scrum, you know, let's implement Jira, etc. Beforehand, it was just like, right, on a Monday morning, I'm going to do this this week. And I'm like, it's not going to work. Focus on upskilling as well, and obviously promote the benefits. Um, it was really key to sort of lift the organization more. I sort of pitched it in a sense that if the company does better, then you'll eventually do better as well. So it was in that sort of sense. So from a technical perspective, I implemented DevOps tooling and processes. I migrated to the cloud. I adopted serverless. I love serverless. Um, and you know, improved technical processes within the organization. So in terms of costs, I spent £1,500 on training, so £600 on ACAR Guru subscriptions. Um, off the top of my head, I believe another 500 was AWS certifications as well, because obviously if you sit one, you get one half price for the next one. Um, and I believe 400 was, oh, that was it, PHP um, Laravel Vapor. So if you're deploying PHP applications to AWS serverless, to Lambda, much easier to do Laravel Vapor. It will save you a lot of headaches. Oh, yeah, that's in the tooling. Um, but yeah, I basically spent about £2,000 if you like, so not a lot of money, very accessible. Um, to the end result, it was faster, cost effective and productive. I say about 70% compared to on-prem costs, really key. Faster, instead of us taking four hours to deploy on a Friday and everybody missing the trains home, um, I could do it in about four minutes. So everybody wins. Um, and of course, more productive. We could ship faster, build faster, and that means more products, which means you know, more income for the company, which was needed at the time, particularly in COVID. So what could I have done better? Use other tools. So as I mentioned, Azure Landing Zones, I didn't know about them until I moved to Microsoft. It's a really big thing that we're pushing at the moment. Really key, highly recommend you look at them. Um, obviously had a bigger budget. I would have loved to hire more people, have more training resources and bigger budgets and longer processes. At the time, just wasn't affordable. Um, so yeah, I was quite young and very early, very early in career when I did this. So it was a really steep learning curve. So I got, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity. Um, but yeah, it is what it is really. So focus more on management of infrastructure as well. Um, so in terms of resources, I focused obviously on training sites. I used ACAR Guru, really like what they do over there. Um, you know, so good training, Microsoft Learn is free, if you even on an even tighter budget. I believe AWS has got different skill courses and things now, uh, which is quite good. Obviously vendor resources, check out, you know, getting started blogs and YouTube channels. And Liam, um, who sadly isn't here tonight, he does a lot of stuff on our active YouTube channel and different talks and things like that. Other cloud vendors do the same. Obviously, attend community events. I spend a lot of my time doing community <coughs> events. I recommend you join them. You're here tonight, so for me, that's a plus one already. Um, but it's a great way to learn, you know, network and meet people as well. And get involved with online communities as well, Discord, etc., and things like that. Or just be active on Twitter, if you still even use Twitter. Um, and yeah, and finally, I'm going to copy Nike on this. Just do it. Seriously, just do it. It's scary, it's daunting, um, but just do it and get going and it should eventually work its way out. We're engineers, we're basically trained to uh, try and figure things out, hopefully not under too much stress and firefighting, but there you go. So FinOps, we've already talked about this. Um, but yeah, I just want to reiterate, FinOps Foundation, it's a great foundation, they do lots of good work, they're in the CNCF, um, they're running more events across the UK, so if you're interested more on the financial management side, I know from our perspective we're seeing increasing number of clients obviously talking about FinOps and different things, lots of organisations and C-suites, it's their top of mind at the moment. So yeah, highly recommend you check into it. So thank you for listening to me rambling on for 15 minutes. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, if you want to reach out or attend one of our meetups, please follow me on LinkedIn and uh, attend, yeah? Cool. So finally, any questions? Questions? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Okay, let's go over here to stop. No, I'll go to you. You're closer. Sorry. But the training Come to sites, you. can you tell me the, the site URL you used to, for your learning? Sure, so I used a Cloud Guru, <coughs> which is quite good. Um, they, are, they are on the more pricey end. But interesting about a Cloud Guru is, is they, um, they oh, I think Ryan, I can't remember his last name, he did a great talk on it. They ran like iCloud Guru for like pence, like their AWS was pence a month and things like that because they optimized it and were scalable so much. So yeah, it's quite interesting use case. Sorry for rambling on, but. Sorry, did you say iCloud Guru? iCloud Guru, yeah. Cloud Guru, yep. Yeah.
Ryan Schunerberg, something, yes, like, something like that. that I yeah. think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Eight Cloud Guru. If you go, I think it's part of. Um, they got Plural bought site. by Pluralsight. Thank, yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for the talk. No um, it's kind of ideal for the situation I'm in at the moment, where um, I'm working in a very small business, like a startup, um, and everyone's sort of saying, you know, go servers, go servers, mm -hmm. etc. Um, and you mentioned budget's really important to a, to a small business, but also forecast, forecasting budget is just as important. So I was wondering, like, one of my big kind of hurdles to get over mentally is probably the change to go for something that is serverless that can do with, you know, requests and scale up to a point where I feel like you kind of lose that control in terms of budget. So how would you approach maybe like forecasting budget with, with scaling systems and things like that? That's the million dollar question. I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think that there is a need for more FinOps sort of tooling and vendors. Who knows, someone in this room might create the next FinOps startup in London. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a good quick question. I, I think maybe try and run a different use case and then think, you know, try and go from there. Really, predicting costs is a really big issue. So it, it depends, bro. So that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but that's, that's the best I can give you, I'm afraid. Good, good, good. Uh, next question, over here at the back. I remember you. Thanks. Thank you for the, uh, the talk. Uh, quick one, you mentioned um, like part of the training that they're just going through sort of like certifications and that obviously yeah. contributed to the, to the, uh, to the cost uh, of, of training yourself up. Uh, I am curious how much like looking back do you feel like those AWS certifications were valuable for you know, uh, which part of those different like tra of training things that you did you felt like most valuable because I, is the certification, do you feel like more of a credibility thing or is it actually like helpful from a training perspective? Thanks. Oh, good question. I'll wait for the microphone for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Very good question. Um, and on that, I think some people do certifications for the sake of doing certifications, particularly if you're a consultant's company, obviously partner benefits and things, it's not just AWS to do that. The reason why I picked the certifications is because traditionally I've thought about doing a lift and shift, more of a narrow mindset, but then when I started to do the training, obviously being very new to cloud space and all my colleagues were as well, it was a great way to learn about Lambda and like serverless technologies and things, so you've got a, a different wider... You, you, you basically look through things through a different perspective, which is quite key. So, yes, it could have been avoided. Did I have to sit the certification? Probably not. But it was a good way to sort of learn the training, and it's more guided now. It's good to learn about best practice as well, particularly when you're new. But if you've more experience in the cloud and you're switching cloud vendors, probably not. So. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Oh, a couple more over here. Uh, you've had one already, so I'll just go to this gentleman first. Oh, yes, thanks for that presentation. They, um, one of the difficulties in getting started on something like getting started on DevOps is making choices, choices <coughs> in technology. Have you any experience of making choices and later deciding that they weren't the best choices? <laughs> Gives you time to think of a good answer, doesn't it, yeah. um, Ethan? Oh. Oops. Oh. To answer your question all the time. Um, that's a daily occurrence, whether it's in my current job or in, uh, or in previous jobs. It's all about the steep learning curve, effectively. Um, so in this instance, I used SES. Has anybody used SES? Yeah. Yep. And I've also used SQS as well. Has anybody used SQS? SQS yep. is great. So I built a PHP Laravel application. It basically went in between. So it had an SQS um, Q pipeline. I've not used AWS in a while. Um, and essentially, basically, if it didn't go through to queue an email, it kept on going through, which I thought was great. You know, a bit of resiliency, redundancy, etc. Thought I was being all smart. Anyway, I got a pager at nine o'clock on a Sunday evening because eight million emails are queued through. And my boss was shouting, "Why is the AWS bill 1,500 pounds this month instead of 100?" Um, and then I had to obviously go on call and deal with it, and it was a nightmare. So. Certain things like that is understanding the limitations. Is some things look shiny and great, and you'll go and pick them. But if you don't understand the limit, the limitations have the training, etc., and you just implement it blindly, which I naively did, um, then it can backfire on you. So yeah, um, I now don't do much on, on call work for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not working up to a stupid AWS bill, then you've not you've yeah. not you've not lived cloud yet, have you? Uh, let's go over here. Uh, thank you for that talk again. Um, good question. I want to know your background for going to DevOps to say you have a software engineering um, degree and what's your opinion on people? I mean, what's your opinion on is it possible to go to DevOps without having such a background in software engineering like basic about how computer works or like, your opinion there? 
it's too much of a jump and you need to have some prior experience working as a typical software engineer. Oh. Come on. The next meeting, all like, question answers must sit in the same area. <laughs> Very good question. I get asked this a lot. Um, so for those of you who don't really know, but I do advise. I've advised a lot of big Fortune 500 companies, enterprise companies on apprenticeships. I've also been working with governments and local governments and things on how to engage young people into the industry. It's a big issue. To answer your question, it's difficult. I started this industry very young. I started when I was 16, dropped out of young, um, sorry, dropped out of school early and things like that. At the time, I had a bit of software engineering experience, so it did that initially. I sort of got that grounding. I don't code that, that well. I'm, I'm not brilliant at it. I'm very open about it. I do like the more of the operations automation side. So I believe you can do it. I think getting that, I'm very fortunate that I had these, you know, like I was able to do a cloud migration, really my first, like one of my first jobs, which is very rare to do. And picking up these like really demanding experience, I think a lot of people would agree in here, the best way to learn skills is everything goes down and you've got to do things under pressure and you pick up different skill sets. Not the best way, but it's what happens, right? Um, so, you know, you, you can do it. Um, I think there's a, a different shift now. Um, there's obviously DevOps friendships, a lot of Consultants companies in London, things like that, they run programs and training programs and get your hands on, etc. Run through scenarios and things. Um, I believe there are like more cloud focused degrees now. I think there's a cloud computing undergraduate degree and a master's degree. I think University of Lincoln and Coventry do them. I think University of London or one of the London universities does it well, so it's quite quite key. Um, it, it, it does happen. There are DevOps graduate. I think I would recommend getting more of a grounding before jumping in. It, you know, even if it's just a year. A lot of people said the same to me when I became an architect. Like, you've only got three years' experience. How can you be an architect? Um, but somehow I've managed to do it because you just sort of learn the experiences and learn as you go. But yeah, it's it depends. If if you've had those fortunate experiences, you should be good. But it, even if you've got five years' experience and you've not done much operationally, you might struggle a bit. So that's a bit of a long-winded, wishy-washy answer. Um, but yeah, there you go. Wishy-washies. Uh, any more questions? One over here. Come down the middle. There you go. Thank you for that there. Um, just a quick question related about this software engineering. What do you think about guys who are starting to into the DevOps engineers or DevOps journey, but they don't know about any kind of programming language? Is that something that's required in the DevOps world? Okay. Did you say front end language? Programming language. Oh, programming language. Sure, so I think learning programming is key. Um, obviously, I do stick more to Bash, PowerShell, Terraform, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to learn Go. Um, it's been a difficult one. I'm, I'm still trying to do it. Um, you know, I really want sufficient in it. One of my goals is to eventually become an SRE. Um, so obviously, learning more of the programming side is is quite key. So it is obviously worth it. But I think one thing I initially went off to thought oh, to start learning Go, and then I made the mistake of actually I needed to rejig on the fundamentals, the you know, data structure, algorithms, etc. Although they are boring, um, you know, you need to get that grounding before you eventually learn programming and things like that to have a good way. And I try and link it operationally to so get more hands on and try and link it to the work I'm doing now instead of just coding a nice shiny web app, um, you know, trying to utilize it in best experiences like operationally and deploying things and trying to link things together. Um, Liam Hampton um, actually has a really good um, get, get, uh, getting started with Go talk. He's doing it at the minute with Reactor in person and online as well. So if you want to learn Go, check it out. Bit of a plug. Excellent. <laughs> and also I'd argue that like um, the way configuration as code is going, Do you actually you're kind of sort of programming anyway, yeah. right? You've got loops, iterators, all this sort of thing. So um, yeah, I think it's kind of, you don't necessarily have to learn something, you know, C to do yeah, this well, stuff, but. All of them are of C. Yeah, 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 yeah true. C. What is Python, what is the Bash, what is yeah. this? Yeah. It has, a, it has a foundation in C. I exactly, guess. yeah. You had a question as well, didn't you? Uh, yes. Um, I'll put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, what I wanted to ask you about, actually, this is quite interesting, actually, because there was the, where, where, I'm of a company that looks after uh, local authorities and stuff, migrate to the cloud. Yeah, yeah. And they keep on changing their minds, mm -hmm. you know, change requests. Yeah, yeah. COVID didn't help at all. Uh, we started development based with AWS. For some reason, a quarter of them didn't like AWS, 
I don't want to save the license, it's my getting their on premises license onto Azure. Yeah. Because Microsoft gives the benefit, yeah. yeah. something behind. And I have to change the Terraform scripts, okay, to deploy a couple of applications off premises, off uh, the co location to save me money. And what I can understand is this. You just mentioned it in one of your talks. <laughs> I had to take I had to take a certification. Luckily, luckily COVID came around, so it gave us a break. So I did some certification with uh, Asha. <coughs> and what I can understand was the interoperability between. I don't know what you've heard about the two called Aviatrix. Have you heard about? Vaguely, yes. Aviatrix, okay. Yeah. The interface <laughs> between all the hyperscalers, especially two Terraform. Now, what's the best plan? What's the best move if people are move, moving away from on premises, co location facilities of the cloud? What do you think is the best approach? Mm -hmm. So, TLDR, I think we're asking what's the best approach for moving from on prem to the cloud? Yeah. There you go, open canvas, Ethan. This is a question I get asked a lot. Um, so, to answer sort of the first part of it, so if you're, so like for example, local councils, right, they may, some may go to Azure, some may go to AWS, some may go to GCP. Um, so one really good example, a public example of this is the NHS have something called the Cloud Center of Excellence. Um, and they essentially have different best practices. You go on the website, I think of gov other government departments do this as well. And then for different NHS trusts, they have different best practices and recommendations to get started um, and you know, move to the cloud if you like. From a local council standpoint and things like that, if they were, so like, take for example local council, um, you may have a couple of staff and things like that, they're not vastly staffed teams from my own experience, some obviously larger ones do, but for small ones like Barnsley for example, they're not going to have you know, that many staff and things. So I think obviously it is a bit of a prolonged journey, so in that instance I would probably do a phased, sort of focus on a workload, so I'd get your groundings if you like, so for example if you run Azure AD on-prem and things like that, you can then host it in the cloud and then obviously use Azure AD Connect to sort of sync between the two and then focus on doing a workload, so it might be one production and a development, or get your development environment set up before and then eventually move up to a phased. Um, other times, you know, you may, have, may, for example, have a scenario where your data center needs to be closed really quickly and things like that. Obviously, then it's just all hell breaks loose and you've got to get it in the cloud ASAP. Um, but if you do do it workload, my suggestion is, what I personally recommend is, if you want to move in, lift and shift initially and sort of test the waters and see if it works for you, great. And then eventually sort of re-architect and look for a more cloud native solution and things. Or you could just do that from the get-go. It really depends on what kind of workloads are you doing, how, how critical are they, can they be moved to the cloud, you know, are they really legacy, for example, if you're running Windows Server 2003 and things like that, moving it to Azure, you get the benefit of, you know, prolonged security and things like that. So you've got to sort of manage it. It's a very open-ended question, if you like, but yeah, there you go. Much like DevOps, very, very open-ended. Okay, uh, brilliant. Um, Ethan, thank you so much, brilliant.